Hi guys, again, we got to talk about Bitcoin and all this other stuff. Okay, so the panel's name is, again, pretty weird, investment objective valid or whatever. So we got to talk about crypto. <laughs> um, so let's begin. I'll start with the intro. Investment profile right now is pretty, pretty, pretty not promising, right? Because if you look at traditional assets, we're looking at stocks, what, how much we can expect? 8% in the US domestic markets, bonds are dead, commodities pretty weak. Uh, maybe, maybe precious metals if there's a crisis coming up. Um, real estate is all times highs, right, in majority of cities. So it's the majority of investment opportunities out there is pretty much lacking. So crypto could be one of those alternative assets, and that's what I would like pretty much, you know, for all of us to talk about and talk, obviously talk about your projects, which I was not aware of. <laughs> so let's begin the round of introductions. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, I'm Richard, uh, CEO of Temptum. Um, this is a seven-year project so far, a new blockchain technology, and we're focusing now on um, really bringing the technology of blockchain to uh, national currencies. Uh, hi, my name is Karem. I'm the founder of a company called Penrose Partners. It's a emerging technology consulting firm. Um, I've been a researcher and consultant specifically in the blockchain space for five years now. Uh, so I've advised investors, enterprises, governments, and regulators on understanding and navigating the blockchain industry, as well as helping startups scale and communicating with their traditional counterparts. So, uh, hi, my name is Yali Harari, and I think I'm the Israeli flag out here, so thank you for that. And I'm an entrepreneur after many years of being on both sides of an investor and an entrepreneur and an executive. And uh, I think I'm the only one who is not going to talk just about crypto or just about uh, regulations, and I'm not a lawyer, just a mathematician. And I've built a company called Innovesta Technologies that was really looking at the perfect storm that's happening in this industry or our industries, whether it's where to invest, how to invest, who can invest, what is the blockchain, what is crypto, what is crowdfunding. And everybody is looking at all those things with great opinions today, but we've built a company that understands who is the company you're looking at to invest. And if no one will bridge the gap between traditional ways of understanding an entrepreneur and meeting them and taking six months and looking them in the eye and trusting them to a short video or some white paper on a website, then how can we really fulfill this revolution? So uh, we have a platform for investors to unlock the DNA of the assets they're looking at and understand what's fake news, what's the credibility of this team, what are they doing, really automated with an AI uh, context-based multi-engine approach, really understanding who they are, what they are, and not just uh, you know feeling good about it or following someone. And it's not just before you invest, it's also after you invest. So the ability to know who did you invest in without really having all the old traditional mechanisms, we believe is the only way to complete this uh, revolution. So that's why I'm here, and I'm happy to be with all of you. Okay, uh, I'm also very happy to be here. Thank you all for attending. My name is Mo Morsi. I am the founder and CEO of DevNull Productions. We are the leading provider of XRP blockchain analytics. XRP, as many of you might know, is the third largest cryptocurrency by market cap. Uh, on that front, uh, you know, because this whole industry is very new and very nascent, there is a lack of tooling that's needed for uh, many financial types, many uh, analysts and whatnot. And DevNull Productions strives to provide the sort of tooling. Uh, my background, I'm a software engineer by trade. I was uh, an engineer at Red Hat for 12 years. I worked on a plethora of solutions when I was there. And I was an early blockchain adopter, uh, buying my first Bitcoin in 2011. Um, I think I remember Sam saying uh, he bought it his for $100. I bought mine for $10. Um, <coughs> You know, in that time, I've seen the ups and the downs. I've seen this space uh, go through many different cycles, uh, some good, some bad. But 
you know, one of the, I guess the tragedies or one of the bad things that uh, I noticed in this that there's a lot of speculation driven by hype, and even to this day. How do you solve that? Through data and analytics, and we provide those, those sort of solutions. Perfect. So it seems like we're short on time. That's a great introduction. You flew from Israel. <laughs> so let's get to the gist. So again, we're looking f into traditional assets. We look into digital assets. So how about this? How about you guys describe what do you see right now in the digital asset trends as far as maybe there are certain sectors in digital assets. Maybe there are certain, well, clearly blockchain technologies. Maybe there's some other technologies such as so what do you guys see on this forefront? Yep, sure. So right now, where, where I'm seeing this is there's been a movement away from pure speculation now to actually being used. So we saw in uh, 2017 a lot of white papers, and a lot of these projects now are coming online. Uh, for example, we're seeing now actual blockchain technologies being used. Uh, they've actually been deployed, and they're now actually being used for what they were designed for. So we're now seeing the use cases now actually start developing. And it's quite an exciting time to actually watch not the technology in play anymore because the technology now is not the driving force. The blockchain is not the use anymore. It's, it's now what it can do. So, uh, for example, with Tempton's case with the national currency, it's the actual, okay, now the technology works, it's great, but okay, how can we deploy this? And that's really where, where we see in the market move as well with the assets and everything now is how can they use not the technology now to actually function and give the benefits that everybody said they could do. Um, personally, I think something interesting that's maturing is uh, for digital assets is stable coins. Um, I think it's an easier concept for a lot of people to digest and understand how it parallels currencies that we've been using traditionally for many years. So whether it's a pegged to a US dollar or it's actually backed by something that is stable, this is, I think, uh, a good step in the direction of actual adoption. Um, as you guys know, a lot of cryptocurrencies are quite volatile, making it so that a lot of investors are worried about, you know, when do I get in? How do I get in? You know, how much should I put in where? How much, how much tooling is needed to actually stay on top of all this volatility? And, you know, with that, you do have crazy opportunities to find inefficiencies in the market or gaps in the market or arbitrage opportunities. But I think um, a big, big movement right now is, uh, you know, creating stable coins that mimic currencies that we use today, but being able to track them, create, you know, cleaner audit trails for those currencies and to have it be more interoperable between nations. So, you know, if you can use a U.S. dollar coin here in the U.S., being able to go over to, let's say, you know, Italy and be able to just pay with your stable currency and on the back end that settlement uh, just kind of happens into their native currency. This is where I think like global economics and finance is really going to take the first step. And then as a lot of traditional players and investors and financial institutions start wrapping their heads around how, you know, blockchain is being applied to a stable currency, then we're going to see, you know, kind of more assets that might be able to appreciate in value. Uh, be more adopted. Like, somewhere. and what do you see as, the, as those assets, right? Because stable coins, they're not supposed to grow. So investing in those stable coins is just like investing in a project. But if you are not the investing into the project, mm -hmm. what are some trends that you might foresee on that front of digital assets growing? Of growing, um, like in, in value. Uh, so I think when you think about what a stable coin is, it's essentially stable because the U.S. dollar is stable. But if you now don't associate with the U.S. dollar and you associate it with gold. Right now, the price of gold moves, you know, not as much as the price of Bitcoin moves, but this is a physical asset that has value and now be able to digitize that physical asset, fractionalize it and use it to either uh, pay for things, to exchange it on different markets. You now actually start, you know, being able to fractionally invest in gold or a similar example is real estate. Um, being able to invest in real estate is a very, you know, tough market to get into if you're a little guy, right? Like I don't know about anyone else here. Maybe Mo with his big bitcoins can buy an apartment, but it's our piece now. Yeah, I, I, I personally can't afford to buy or buy into a, you know, large apartment construction or, or, or into a large apartment like that. So being able to take a physical asset like 
a real estate, any type of real estate, digitize it and be able to hold the value of that physical asset in a digital form to you know, fractionalize it, have more inclusion, more accessibility for other smaller investors to actually participate in a large investment. And as the value of that real estate asset appreciates, everyone's fraction of that asset appreciates. So I think those Perfect. are kind of So Yali? Yeah. yeah. Moving on. Please. Do you remember the question? Um, yes. <laughs> Not jet lagged, so it's fine. Um, so definitely, stable coins, I think, is a result of the uh, crisis we all had. Even the name has to be, you know, how we approach the industry with something like that. But I would totally echo what you said about real estate. What we see from our clients now, there's a lot of interest in how to do that and what's going on there, because it's still something people can understand, and it's in the in the world of uh, of you know of real physical assets. And, uh, but I think we'll see more change and more risk player plays or risky things coming up, gratefully so, in the next, you know, 18 months or so. Oh, it's a tough question, you know. Um, Don't pitch XRP to us. Uh, oh, no, not at all, <laughs> not at all. I'm not a maximalist. I'm still very bullish on Bitcoin and whatnot. Uh, you know, <sighs> It's funny that you tied Bitcoin to real estates and um, a lot of these uh, tokenization talk to tokenization that um, you know has come up in this panel or in these panels uh, because there's a lot of uh, issues, lit litigation issues that need to be resolved before I really see that these solutions can be feasible. Um, you know, with XRP, for example, you have the notion of trust lines and you can issue any currency on the ledger. Well, what happens when those currencies get out of sync or those issuances get out of sync? You know, what happens when, uh, you know, a previous panelist brought up the issue of a network fork and now you have two representations of a uh, single asset in the real world? Um, you know, these are questions that need to be solved. And certainly I am confident that they will be solved. Uh, if to answer your question, Peter, maybe the trend that I'm noticing in, in the sector is the stabilization of the entire sector, not necessarily of a one particular currency, but the whole notion of the blockchain and uh, what it's used for and what it can be used for. It certainly seems that the Wild West aspect of it, again, to go to the previous. So slide. volatility is dropping, great. Yeah. So therefore, it's a little bit more safe for investors to consider alternative assets cryptocurrencies as, uh, as alternative assets for their portfolios. So now let's go back with you, Mo. We'll start. Uh, which factors, which metrics investors should consider to either select or, you know, or just not select a given cryptocurrency or a given blockchain project? So what are you looking for? The team, the technology, the liquidity? Talk to us. Yeah, I think all those things are important, of course. Uh, you know, technology is meant to be uh, for humans, right? It can't just, we can't just focus on the technical aspects of a particular ecosystem or a, t a solution. Now, that being said, if there are performance, um, you know, there are performance considerations. Certain blockchains are more scalable than others. Certain ones are, are less um, subjected, uh, subject to hacking and other uh, nefarious acts. But let's talk about these people in the room. Yeah. They want to invest. Yeah, of course, what of course. they should look for. So, you know, certainly look at the regulatory uh, environments. You know, this is going to come down to where you're uh, investing from and what you're investing into. Look at the company, the team behind the uh, currencies, the, the blockchain which you are investing in. Uh, I think those two go hand in hand. If they're not working with the regulators, I think that uh, they're not doing it right. Uh, and then look at the utility. You know, utility perhaps is the number one consideration everyone should look at when evaluating a cryptocurrency. You know, if it's some ambiguous kind of made up problem, well, how long, it might have the hype of today, but how long will that hype last? Uh, on the other hand, if it is solving a real legitimate world world um, issue, a use case that needs to be solved, then the price will follow. Then the uh, users will come in and that- Understood. So we got team, would be regulations, and utility. Yali, so you have, your platform has a bunch of AI-based metrics, all, but artificial I'll answer intelligence. Your, your question. So I think investors should invest as, they, as in any other project. 
you know, yes, looking at regulations specifically in this uh, space we're in, I agree, but you have to really look at the fundamental due diligence and have the ability to understand, is it a real business? Is there a great team? What is the competition? You know, you can't ignore all of those things and then expect uh, statistically that this uh, currency will be great. So would you say that the majority of people here, I'm assuming not super technical savvy to really understand blockchain? they should skip this opportunity at this moment? No, no, not at all. I, but I think we shouldn't just look at the crypto excitement and the regulations without looking at the use case and the business and the competition, because then we are facing regular early stage risky statistics. So I actually. So what does your platform look at, look at when analyzing projects? So our platform looks at uh, you know three looks at three things mainly. But one of the main one is we scroll everything that's out there. We take the fake news component out of those projects. So we understand the credibility of the source, the integrity of the information out there, the management team, the agility of this. Uh, a whole uh, proposition, the competition. So people, when they look at this, they understand what they're what they're looking at. And after 2015 to 18, you know, the fear is okay. It's legitimate. We as a as the people in this industry have to solve it. So the ability to understand the credibility of what's going out there without the ability to see the people, I think is really important. We can't skip that. And uh, even when we'll get to a regulation in 18 months or so, that or nine months, okay, um, and everything will seem to be okay with regulations, then you still have those basic questions about the business. Perfect. So um, that's what I think. So Karen, Robert, same question. So you have a portfolio. You have obviously your Bitcoins, Litecoins, Ethereums, whatever you guys prefer. What investors should consider? We're talking about average investors. Yeah, so like to be honest, I think it really does start at education right now. Uh, this is a really technically complex field. Like the, the infrastructure that's being developed for all these projects to build on is really complex in nature. So you know, just kind of speculating on a lot of different things, you know, is one thing, but, you know, and, and I agree with what both of them have said is it's like doing traditional analysis into a company or a project. You have to look at the team, you have to look at the technology, you have to look at the use case and, and make sure that all these pieces fit as if you are traditionally investing in anything. But what I think is like, to like people got lucky in this industry like let's not like shy away from that there was a lot of times where people would buy a crypto for some purpose that wasn't you know to make a million dollars and then all of a sudden something happened and they did unfortunately those opportunities are not as easy as they were so to if you really want to be a savvy investor in this space you have to really do a lot of research and like get your team educated. Have people, at least one person or two people in, in, of, of your analysts living and breathing in the space to truly understand where those real opportunities lie. Because, you know, it, it's hard to take shots in this industry. Like there's so many startups building. There's so many, di like, you got to think about this way. There's multiple blockchain infrastructures that are being developed. There's multiple applications on each of these infrastructures being developed. And then there's people applying it in different ways and building different businesses out of those applications. So, you know, you could either invest in the underlying currency that runs that infrastructure. You could invest in the currency and that gives you access to the network of you know one of the applications or you can actually invest into the equity of a company that's building around this product so like it, it's, it's so we have a so we have a very simple question <laughs> that none of you guys answered because you're on the record uh, being recorded by Twitter or whatever is streaming this thing well I would so say just where would you invest as an average investor? maybe the answer is just skip it so, so you're saying like if I was invested, what do I want? These guys over there. Okay, I would say to start, get your hands on some Bitcoin. Okay, just simple economics. There's a finite supply of Bitcoin. There's more people every day learning about Bitcoin and becoming interested in the utility of peer-to-peer -peer transfer of value. Okay, so I think that right now, you know, Get your hands on some Bitcoin. Experiment with it. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with you on that one. Okay, yeah. well, I'm going to I'm going to be a nice. Do not be checks at P. You know, we all have our favorite cryptocurrencies and uh, whatnot. 
Um, I do take issue with the notion that any cryptocurrency is a store of value. Um, this whole sector is nascent, as I mentioned earlier. And, uh, you know, go with gold. Go with something that's been used for thousands of years. Now, if you are comfortable with the speculative nature, uh, look into a diverse portfolio, um, XRP being one of the assets, Bitcoin another one, Ethereum. Uh, hashtag this is not financial advice, you know, don't uh, leverage. Cut this out, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but for me, the number one consideration is utility. Really look at what is being used and, you know, wearing my engineering hat uh, right now, look for simpler solutions. You know, when you have... But this gentleman, I mean, ladies and gentlemen in this room right now, I mean, are they going to take a book, Blockchain for Dummies, issued by IBM, and no, actually read no. it about the technology and figure out, oh, Tezos has nothing. That book EOS quickly out probably of date, has nothing. For sure, yeah. Bitcoin probably has something. Like, oh, how are they going to select? Are we talking specifically, very specific, realistic Look advice? who's adopting the blockchain for what, for what, you know, uh, again. XRP, it's being used by MoneyGram, SBI, Santander for cross-border remittances. That's why I'm so bullish on it. So you pitched XRP. Richard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I disagree with the XRP comment there. Um, <laughs> with, uh, I agree, though, Bitcoin's probably the easiest way in because it, the entire architecture is built around this. So if you want to taste this uh, space, if you like, understand public private keys, it, that's where you're going to need to because everything's designed around Bitcoin because it was the first. So if you are investing into currencies, understand the basics, understand how to hold keys because most of the hacks I see are through the key management. So investing in all these obscure uh, currencies without actually understanding how, how the basic ones work is a risk in itself because once you lose keys or you get compromised in any way, you're going to lose your investment. So. By having the Bitcoin and the, the top 10, if you like, because they're pretty much a very good infrastructure, that's a very safe way to start because you can have, you start understanding how everything works, you understand how exchanges work, how to send transactions. It's a good starting point there. So you understand crypto in general. And then when you start looking off onto cooler projects, the, the biggest one I have is basically, does it need a blockchain? Does it actually use a blockchain? Because a lot of these projects are white papers claiming to use blockchain for some obscure reason. This is a, does it actually need the blockchain? Does it need the technology that you actually are investing in? Or can it be done another way? A lot of the ways we see at the moment don't need blockchain in any way. It doesn't, act, and it doesn't actually benefit at all from the cryptography behind um, the blockchain as well. So yeah. Okay. Go. Understood, so good. So, so far the advice has been read books, buy BTC, buy top 10, and maybe buy XRP. So good. So now, moving on. Uh, uh, moving on. How much of the, your portfolio should be allocated into crypto, overall digital assets? Not necessarily just crypto, but for example, stable coins. Sure, crypto. Uh, and what are the advantages of having that being allocated in your portfolio? And then after this, I think we need to start doing questions. So I reckon about 20, 25% in, into crypto, um, just because it's it is very volatile. You are in the days of most people still down 98% from highs of 2018. So it's it's just one of those things, the risks are, are there. But it's a very liquid market as well, so you can get cash out and sell very quickly as well. Bet what you're willing to lose, don't go crazy. It's, this is my crazy um, fund, if you like, because it's a bit where I don't mind if I lose, and it's the well shots. You, you bet so you're crazy. willing to lose 25% of your portfolio? Is that what you're I know, saying? you're saying most <laughs> yeah, of your portfolio, 25% seems... into the crypto space. You, you know that most of that is going to be safe, like BTC, Ethereum, you know, it's down at the moment, but it's pretty, it's pretty stable. Like you know where BTC and the... So if your net worth is $1 billion, $250 million should be allocated into Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin, yeah, and yeah. maybe That's XRP. Yeah. No, no XRP. Yeah. No XRP. But so yeah. so if, I, if yeah. I can jump in, a lot of things that we advise uh, family offices, wealth management groups, high net worths, we say 1%. We say start with 1%, see how it goes, experiment, learn, take, like analyze what's going on. Like until you've actually, you know, put something in, you're never really gonna follow it. Like I promise you, if I had sent a hundred dollars of Bitcoin to all of you in this room, you're gonna pay attention. I mean, maybe if you're super rich, hundred bucks is nothing for you. But if that turns to a thousand dollars and it's yours, you're gonna be a little more interested in this and you're gonna do some more research and due diligence on 
what happened? What influenced this to go 10x? And the, and the, the advantages of, of having it in your portfolio. Yeah, of course. And uh, the other thing to think about is some of these cryptocurrencies have no correlation to any other asset class. Like, if you look at the analysis of Bitcoin, it's actually not correlated with currencies, commodity, maybe a little bit with gold, but like, you know, private equities and all these traditional markets, there's no correlation. So why wouldn't you diversify a one or maybe I wouldn't say 20, 25, but why, what is the reason to not put 1% of your portfolio into something that's completely uncorrelated with everything else? Yeah, we can also talk, you would like to say something? I was just gonna say, uh, while that's great for family officers, the average guy on the street, 1% is not gonna make any difference at all. Right? 100 bucks to 1,000, average guy on the street is not, not gonna make, make or break things. That's not one of the stories you hear. So average guy on the street, a lot more, because it's a lot less for them. So that's it. Should they buy 20 to 25%, sorry, oh, yeah. on leverage? <laughs> on leverage. <laughs> Yali. So not just cryptos, overall blockchain projects as well, because if they could be tokenized, you can buy it. Let's go. Right. So uh, I would not go with 25 percent, but uh, in initial reaction of what we hear, again, we're not in that role, is 5 to 8 percent, but specifically in areas that there is some connection or expertise in that family office or fund. So it's not just, uh, okay, I'm going to diversify for the sake of it, but really get to understand what is the value of blockchain, how does it work, you know, so you get an education via investing, but uh, definitely not 25%. What did they get out of it? So f first of all, why 5 to 8% specifically? Secondly, what did they get out of it? So you have $20 million fund, family office, what did they get out of this? So first of all, they will get money out, of, they'll get you know returns out of it for sure. And uh, again, don't go to crazy weird projects at the beginning, but they will definitely get something out of it. But I think it has to also be meaningful, because if you're like just putting something little, then it's gonna be a, you know, the third generation playing with it. But if you really want to do something, then I think it should be a significant topic to track and to learn and to continue. So my favorite contestant. So how much should you allocate into XRP? Hopefully I'll win a prize. Of your portfolio. I'll, I'll win a prize at the end. So, you know, I don't want to uh, share my, you know, personal portfolio, my personal financial advice. This is for the audience and, and for others. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel 25% is a little too high. And, you know, if you are the average Joe on the street, I'm going to, uh, you know, take a risk here and I'm going to say buy some gold. Um, I really think that has the, the history behind it. But uh, if you're risk adverse or if you're risk oriented, excuse me, um, I think 10% might be a good uh, figure. I mean, this is really if you're uh, want to, you know, take a big gamble. Um, otherwise, maybe 5%, I think that's a, a more reasonable. Let me stand on the Richard's side right now, right? Because you guys all kind of, you know, on the record, obviously, trying to, you know, minimize risks for potential investors down the road. I know you guys are loaded potentially with all this stuff, either via personal investments into crypto or into projects that you are advising or working on. Come on. All your, all your time, take this up. So you're really loaded. So 20, 25%, like what can you, what can go wrong? 20, seriously. Oh, well, 20, well, seriously, what, like, what, Bitcoin will disappear tomorrow? Uh, Ethereum will disappear tomorrow? Like, why so low? 1% very conservative for, you know, for huge operations, but, you know, for gentlemen here and ladies. Why not more than 10%? Well, it starts at 1%, and then you can go up, right? Like, it, it's all about getting started. Like, I never tell anyone to go anywhere above 1% to start, because that's the start, right? And the more you learn, and the more comfortable you are, and the smarter you get, say, okay, maybe 5%. And then maybe you're actually actively trading that and taking out profits from you know all that trading. But like we're in a place in this industry where we're trying to get a lot of traditional investment groups, traditional businesses into the industry. And if you tell people that you need to have a large percent of your portfolio into this, they're not even gonna listen to you, to be honest. And I've pitched many, many, many investors on this. And it just comes down to just start small, use it to learn, and if you, if something amazing happens, you have a success story, and if something absolutely terrible happens, it's 1%. 
and you've still learned. And life is about you either winning or learning, right? I mean, that's how I look at it. You either win or Good you learn. Person. So, Good Peter, thank you for this question. <laughs> because uh, I think on the fr previous question, you know, the average Joe on the street, that, that was my answer. But for professional investors, Take tools, tools, really track what you're doing, understand the companies you're watching, and go bigger and make successful decisions. Because even in, not, in traditional due diligence and tracking of portfolios, we are failing as an industry. So there are tools out there. Really understand what's going on and be able with crypto to grow, because then you can actually maybe get out of investments you know, quicker than you would with traditional funds. Mo and Richard, obviously. Yeah. Uh, can we repeat the question? Uh, why 10%? Why is such uh, you know, a risk averser? 10% is for risk-oriented individuals who are willing to uh, you know, expose themselves to that. Um, you know, I think that if you are only at 1%, you might. It's what you said earlier. You know, I don't think you're going to see the necessary impact on your portfolio. Um, you know, I don't subscribe to, we're going to see, you know, who knows, this whole sector is very speculative, but, uh, you know, will we see 2017 again, those sort of gains, those thousandfold gains? Uh, it's pretty doubtful. So, uh, you know, 5 to 10% kind of uh, balance would balance out a portfolio quite well. Obviously, you know, do your due diligence. Make sure, you know, don't be jumping into anything blindly and to really uh, crunch the numbers uh, when you come down to it. Use, um, you know, the many analytics services and whatnot uh, that are out there. Obviously, there, some cryptos have uh, fewer or more than others, but uh, really look into what you're investing in. That's the critical thing. Let's be honest, though, all of us have a lot more than 5%, 10% in, into crypto. Like, if you've been in this space more than a couple of years, and you live through 2017 without, without getting absolutely wrecked, you got a lot more than 5%, 10% in. But the thing with the crypto as well is, it is a very emotional, very emotional uh, space right now. That's why we see a lot of people investing, it's very emotional. It's not, it hasn't got that, from my side, from what I see, it's, it's not got that professionalism yet in this space. So a lot of the projects you see people investing in, they invest in because they're emotional in this project. So it's very hard to, I figure out the future on this, so that's why I'm with that. It's that's why I go very, I'm very bullish on this. It's because the market changes so quickly, and it's it's a good place. But we will go a lot more than ten percent. Hashtag think just, not financial advice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think just one thing to like just for food for thought is if uh, if the if this industry keeps heading in the direction that a lot of us are projecting it to. 100% of your portfolio is going to be in some shape or form a crypto. Yeah. So just like whether it's real estate, whether it's equity in a business, whether it's, you know, anything, gold, whether it's yeah. precious metals, anything, you have to create a digital equivalent of it because our traditional management of it, our traditional trading methods of it and custody of it are, are failing us. And if, you know, companies and businesses and regulators aren't noticing this yet, then we have bigger problems to worry about. But so what I see is that eventually all assets will exist in a digital form and blockchain technology is the technology that's going to enable that. So questions. I mean, it's pretty dry in the room right now for whatever reason, because there's no lunch provided <laughs> by the organizers. Questions? Anybody has questions? You better have. Token? What's up? You didn't get the token? <laughs> the lunch token. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> so in commodities, traditionally, that a new investor would maybe paper trade for a while and track his performance. And obviously, there are disclaimers with cash performance doesn't guarantee future results. So given the volatility that there is in this marketplace, how does a new investor so the question so the question is again could you please just summarize this in one sentence as a new investor if you're paper trading or practicing how does he really know how he's going to do uh,
So pretty much question, I, I think, goes like this. So digital assets are way more volatile. So when you go to traditional assets, even if you pay per trade or have any kinds of you know, algorithmic strategies that you're backtesting at the moment, it's easier to forecast, potentially easier to forecast uh, the potential gains and losses due to more predictive volatility. What about digital assets? Um, I guess I can open that up. I would say a lot of the strategies and analysis that goes into traditional trading is being applied to the cryptocurrency market. So I would say that like tools and types of dashboards actually exist right now. Like as if you were to use a Bloomberg terminal to analyze traditional markets, there's the equivalent of that for cryptocurrency. So there's tools and platforms being built like actively for, to kind of cover all of that. I mean, we, we could talk about after about actual projects, but um, those resources and those tools are being developed so that people can have access to that. You know, I agree with that, but, um, you know, we have to recognize that crypto is a whole nother beast. Uh, the same strategies, the same um, you know, patterns and whatnot that we see in traditional equities, we're not going to see in crypto. Uh, you know, maybe reduce your time frame, you know, to uh, to look at, uh, you know, microseconds, if you will, you know, instead of uh, minutes and hours uh, where the technical patterns might, uh, you know, yield more results. Um, you know, it's not going to be until the market stabilize a lot more, which, you know, the trend, speaking about the trends, is the trend I mentioned earlier that, you know, some of those traditional uh, ways of analyzing these sectors will be applicable. But until then, um, you know, that's when the portfolio allocation comes in. Only put in what you're willing to, to lose. So the organizers are cutting this amazing, super interesting, the best panel on this whole event. <laughs> so whoever is tagging this thing, uh, tag all of the participants and round of applause. And the last question that I would like your participants to respond underneath this po that post is, which project do you hate the most in the blockchain space? Yeah.